Thank you. Uh, I'm Tim, and this is Tyrone here. So <clears throat> our talk is going to be about accelerating your app development workflow with React Native. Uh, so our contact details are here. There are Twitter handles. And uh, the demo project we're going to be using in this presentation can be found on GitHub, just there. So the motivation to look into React Native. So we work in an environment uh, that releases new products every couple of weeks to customers. We're running uh, Scrum. So what, what you build will eventually change. And it's usually going to change pretty soon after you've already built it. Our UI designs iterate. We get feedback from our customers. It goes into our user research team. Uh, that gets fed into, our, fed into our user experience team and into the designers as well. And they tell us developers, all right, next sprint, your goals are going to be to change something. So we move pretty quickly. We've got uh, multiple teams. I think we're running about eight feature teams at the moment. Nine. So we've got nine different teams going as fast as they can uh, on different parts of the app. And yeah, it can be a, a kind of a, a tricky situation when you need to keep up to date with what everyone else has been building. So the changes that might happen, it might take a designer about 30 seconds in sketch to just drag your UI elements around and, and say, this is what the customers really want and, and pass it on to you. But when it gets to you, you might realize that the change that they're implying, it's going to break all the rules that you wrote to build it in the first place, auto layout rules or, or whatever mechanism you use to make that view. So just like before in the previous React app, we've got a use case and it's about pugs. So for Sprint 1, we need pugs uh, in a, well, that should be portrait, sorry, typo. Yeah, portrait only app. So give me two buttons, one that says show me the puppers, one that says about this silly app. It's a bit of a contrived use case, but just bear with me. So center them on the screen. Uh, make sure there's a 10-point gap between them. Some basic UI rules that you might get from a designer. And so you go into auto layout and you build it and it's over really quickly. And you're done. So you ship that, that's sprint one done, and you ship it to customers. Sprint two rolls around and the designer says, could we just move the buttons to be next to each other if you're on one of those larger phones? I know customers are using them. A VIP got in touch with us and said he's sick of seeing things narrow on his larger phone. Why is it like this? But for people on an iPhone SE, the smallest device, you still need it to be uh, above each other. And you think, OK. So you've got some options to make this change. You could use size classes, right? Or UI stack views. You could do CG rect manipulation. Wouldn't advise that. Um, you could build two different views and sort of hot swap them at runtime. Uh, and you've got visual format language um, that you can use to programmatically change your auto layout rules by detecting something at runtime, like the screen width, for example. So we'll go through these options. So size classes. It's the first thing I thought of when I came up with this, uh, when we came up with this example. And then we found out that all iPhone device sizes share the same class in portrait mode. So when you're varying for traits on an iPhone 7 Plus and you hit done and then you switch over to the SE, you notice that it's still got the same class as before. So the only difference with these size class is when it's in landscape mode or if you're using a, an iPad. And this is a portrait only iOS app. So size classes aren't the right solution for this, this situation. Another option would be UI stack view. Now, UI stack views are awesome. When they came out, we thought this is going to solve so many of our problems. Um, it's available in iOS 9 and above. And if you've got the luxury of having an app that is uh, targeting that SDK or above, you could use a size class. Definitely, no worries. I'd recommend it if you're just going with a, an Objective C app. Uh, but larger organizations, they tend to try and keep as many customers as they possibly can on their apps. And that means don't up the minimum iOS version unless there's a really, really 
incredibly important reason to. Because customers that don't update their app, they suddenly can't get your new features that go out. And this is something that comes up quite often at Sportsbet. So unfortunately, we couldn't use the stack view because we've, we're supporting iOS 8. Okay, so CG rect manipulation. We've all done it. If you're an iOS dev, I'm sure you've done CG rect make and you've done some minuses and you've found the middle part and subtracted half the width of the thing next to it to get it centered and so on. But who wants to write layout code using math in this day and age? And if you're using auto layout as well for your view management, if you try and uh, adjust the frame on an auto layout managed view, you're gonna run into a lot of problems. Okay, so CG rect manipulation, yes, it could get the job done under the right circumstances, but I wouldn't recommend it. You can build two different views, okay? So wide and narrow or whatever I've named it, I wouldn't recommend this. Um, you're just gonna duplicate your assets. You're gonna get duplicate nibs, uh, classes, lines of code, etc. It's probably not the greatest option. If a pull request came in and we saw this, we'd, we'd have some discussion, but constructive feedback about how not to uh, uh, duplicate code. So VFL, I'll save for last. So VFL is a way of, I guess you could programmatically, you could change these strings to be what you've calculated, uh, to, to change the layout, the auto layout constraints that you've built in your, in your nib or your storyboard. It's stringly typed, however, so you, you literally type a string, and you put these hieroglyphics in that represent the edges of things, and there's underscores, and there's arrows, and like if I was to read this, I wouldn't exactly know, like this example in the middle, if it wasn't for that picture, I wouldn't really know what it was doing, and it's gonna be hard for developers in your team, in your wider development um, community at work, to know how to debug this, how to change it. If someone had to take on the changes that you know, Sprint 2 is doing, but they didn't actually build it in the first place. If you've used, used VFL, you've basically given them debt. They need to go and research and, and try and debug how your existing stuff works. Yeah, it's, it's hard to read, right? And you kind of split between two worlds. You've got your interface builder assets or your storyboard assets. You've got your constraints in there. You've set them there, but you've hooked them up to IB outlets and you then change them in your view controller code as well. So you're, you're putting your logic for your view layouts in two different places, or at least setting it up in two different places. So UIKit is great, it's what we use, okay? Apple gives us new SDKs, new APIs, sorry, in these SDKs. And if you've been an iOS dev for a number of years, you can build a static app pretty quickly, okay? So Apple, they bring out new betas, and we put up with the crashes and the inconsistencies and the reasons why it won't work on an iPhone 6 Plus anymore. These things happen in the betas. And it's a yearly thing. You'd think we'd learn from it. But every year we go back and we lap it up and we get the new one and we find a whole new range of exciting errors. Yeah, love to Xcode. But then we look at the web dev. We're in a feature team and she's got a small smile on her face as she drags her task into the done column. When we look back at our screen, we notice that source kit service is terminated. It doesn't have to be this way. We're slow. We're slower than web devs. Which brings me on to React Native. Okay, the scary bits. If you're considering React Native, you haven't taken the plunge yet, these are some things you, could th you should think about if you're uh, going to be using this in an enterprise app. Somewhat costly project setup time. So this is, I guess, just a comparison to File, new project within Xcode, and you've got a storyboard and the view controller, and away you go. Uh, as we saw in the previous talk, there's some setup stuff you need to do, uh, installing Node, uh, Watchman, etc. But once you've done it once, it's okay. You, you kind of get over it. It's just that every developer who wants to use this code has to do that on their machine. Okay, so you're going to be writing readme files in your project that have a detailed setup. And it's JavaScript. Do you like JavaScript? You might be surprised if you haven't touched it in a few years. Okay, ES6, syntaxes and so on, classes and all that. They make things uh, pretty approachable for uh, traditional Objective-C developers or, or Swift developers. It's evolving quickly, and this came up, uh, I guess it was a question from the previous talk or two talks ago. How do you handle version upgrades? So 
When you, you face a challenge and you research this new library that solves that problem for you, you find out that it's got a minimum React Native version 3 releases higher than you currently support. And if you were to upgrade to that release, suddenly a different module suddenly stops working. And this is a real thing. This happens. This is something that you should, it shouldn't be ignored and it should be actually be talked about. You need to um, weigh up the costs of importing that new library, uh, which solves your problem, versus the, uh, the, the resulting change that you need to make to the rest of your app to fix it up. So if one's shorter than the other, yeah, generally go for it. And it's, it's always a good thing to get brought up to a later version of, of a framework. Okay, the exciting bits. React Native uses UIKit. So when you build your views, when you build your lists, that all is uh, corresponding to a UIKit uh, object or item. Okay. When you write a React Native app or a React website, you get a clear, well-documented, and easily understood, I guess easily teachable, hierarchical rendering system. So as we saw in the previous example, or previous talk rather, um, apologies to people who weren't here, there's gonna be a demo from, from us anyway. You get a way to build a component that works basically one way. You have a render method, you've got state, you've got props, and you use that render method on that component to determine how that one component is going to look. Now, if you, if you go back to what I was talking about with UIKit, those options to solve the problem, there was, what, five there? So you've got five different ways <coughs> to solve a particular, particular layout problem uh, using UIKit. If you've got an app that's been going for four, four or five years, you're gonna get developers that come onto your team, and they're gonna work with what they know, and they're gonna use one of those five options to solve a problem. And that's going to happen all throughout your code base. There's going to be teams committing things that, uh, that use a different way to, to render views than someone else has. And they're not wrong. Of course not. The, the, the tools are there. They've used them. And it's not bad code. It works. So this is just something that, to highlight is when you use a React Native app, it's basically one way to do rendering your views. Okay, React Native, it gives you the tools to build a dynamic and continually evolving app. And what I mean by that is it's gonna be easy to change your app using React components. So um, the Lego analogy was really great for using components to build a screen. So you build a component and it's responsible for itself only. It's gonna be the title bar or it's gonna be uh, a, a row of buttons. Uh, you can configure them through props, but they're simply there to run callback methods, get passed in as props as well. They don't care about any other part of the app and they can be used in any other part of your app. It feels like you're putting together Lego pieces to build a house as opposed to shifting foundation to move to make a change to your room that you might get by using UIKit. And you just press Command R to see your changes. It's amazing. Like you hit the play button next code, some Swift compiles for no reason, a nib changes and compiles for no reason and you wait about 30 seconds and it's up. But as you'll see, hitting Command R, or if you've got live reloading on, you don't even need to press that. That's one of the, like, when, you're, when your day job is to write code all day, and you watch your IDE compile code for no reason, it's, it's a waste of your time. This is actually a tangible thing that React Native gives you. So the case study of just moving the buttons, I'm gonna hand over now to Tyrone, who's gonna run us through the project. Um, Tyrone, over to you. Thanks. Yeah. All right, I'm Tyrone. I'm here to commit the ultimate act of hubris, which is trying to do a live demo on stage with actual code. So you can see here we are uni using the shiny new Xcode beta to run two simulators at the same time. Uh, this is the Reactive Park app that we were talking about. Uh, and the code for it is right here. So this, this is all available on GitHub, by the way, if you want to follow along. It's just uh, github.com tyronestudium slash reactorpug. So everything that makes up the following screen is here. And we have a requirement now to change on the iPhone 7 Plus. Uh, these two buttons have to be side by side. What a pain. <laughs> Thanks for that, designer. So uh, what we're going to do, actually, sorry, I was on the wrong page. It's uh, actually this one, home screen. So what we're going to do is 
we need to edit this view. So we have buttons and they're contained in a view here. So I happen to know that that view is this view. So using the magic of Flexbox, I can change the behavior so that it renders uh, the way we want. And you can see uh, you don't have to give up uh, some of the nicer things with Xcode, like uh, tab completion and, and that sort of thing. You can see here it's auto-completing to justify content, and it's even telling me the valid things that I can specify in there because I'm using this thing called TypeScript, which is amazing, and you should use TypeScript too. Uh, so I'll change that to center. And we want to wrap. So there's this thing called flex wrap, which you can set to wrap. So that's probably just hieroglyphics, but trust me, that's what it's supposed to be. Uh, and now that I've done that, I can remove these align self centers. And flex directions row and remove center. So now, Hopefully this will not look any different. Yep. So SE still showing like that. And the seven plus, please God. Yes. <laughs> There's no There's five ways to do that. You will just you solve this problem with Flexbox. Flexbox is the answer. If Flexbox isn't the answer, then you do it with absolute layouts and you do frame calculations yourself. Those are the only options with React Native. But trust me, having less options is good if one of the options is Flexbox. <clears throat> so, what we uh, another thing I wanted to demo up here is sort of this idea of the Lego blocks and how your app is basically just made up of these small components. So we have this thing here. I'll just turn the inspector back on. We have this this thing here, which is the slider, which has an icon, a slider, which is actually a real UI slider, by the way, and a Another icon and then the number, right? That is basically this view to here. It's kind of that's that's a lot of nested layers down, and I don't really like having that many tab characters. So wouldn't it be nice if we could just make that a component called pug page slider? Well, let's just do that. Let's just do it. So I'm going to go up here and I'm going to create a new constant called pug page slider. And this is a react.stateless functional component. And inside the angle brackets, I need to put the, the props. Here's one I prepared earlier. So let's go pug page slider props equals. And because it's a stateless functional component, as was discussed in the last talk, it's literally just a function that takes props and returns JSX. So I can then paste that code that I copied before straight in there. So it's not quite there yet, because before it was reading these values out of state, but now it's props. So if I just change this to props dot proops, props dot and this is no longer, sorry, it's also pages, not pug pages, because we're already in a component called pug page slider. And this is also just going to be props.onValueChange. And this is also going to be props.pages. Cool. So that's it. That's Pretty simple refactoring. You most for the most part, you just take a whole bunch of JSX and stick it in a function. And now the only other thing I have to do is actually put it back into this page. So I just type pug page slider and pass the props down. Pages is going to be this dot state dot pug pages. And on value change is going to be a function that just calls this dot set. Hug pages to the new value and close. And you can see it still works. 
But now, I could add a second slider there just by reusing the pug page slider. So that's basically an example of what a real sort of day in, in React Native. Like, I had so much spare time after fixing that, that, that new feature that wanted to screen too. I had so much spare time, I could even put in refactoring like that. Um, but yeah, so this, this is an, <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> Uh, this is actually in the live Reddit API, so if there's anything here that's uh, uh, untoward, I uh, apologize for that. But this is basically what the app does, is it hits the uh, Reddit API to hit slash r slash pugs to just get pictures of pugs. So there you go. Any questions? Anyone want me to try and do something? Show them the API, Tyrone. The API? Okay. Uh, so the API literally hits the uh, reddit.com slash r slash pugs. And uh, this is the entirety of the, the API code because it uses uh, uh, TypeScript slash ES6 stuff. You get async await, which is nice. And maybe one day Swift will get that too. Uh, so what it does is um, you pass in the number of pages you want it to load from Reddit, and then it will hit Reddit that many times to append that many pages of posts together. So this was sort of a performance test. So if you wanted to try and load 10 pages, that's going to be quite a lot of poppers. I don't know if my poor, poor little Vodafone tether can handle that much. but. Even with that, you can see like the performance of this, this scroll view is still totally fine. I can actually show you this running on my iPhone 7 if you want, if you actually want to see this on an actual device running in production mode on React Native. If you're skeptical about the performance of React Native at all, and you should be, um, like, full disclosure, uh, React Native runs all of its JavaScript in an interpreter. It doesn't even JIT, right? So it is probably somewhere in the order of 10 to 100 times slower than Swift. And yet, despite being 100 times slower, you still don't notice it because React is so fast. Performance, we've just basically touched on that with um, Tyrone covering that off there. So we'll just move along. Oh, this last point, yeah, I kind of mentioned it a bit before. The real performance boost you get is with regard to developer effort. So not to mention targeting both uh, iOS and Android from the one code base. And if you're a bit crazy like we are, you might be targeting web as well. Um, but that's a different, different talk. So we'll do a summary. So your views, they can be lightweight and replaceable. You can build, as we saw, a um, stateless functional component that's about 10 lines long and does exactly what it needs to and only what it needs to. It's simple to refactor views into reusable components, just like we saw before. You can take uh, things that you reckon you might use again, put them into their own component, and use that across your app. And if you've had sort of an intro to React Native and you've used it and you've seen what it can do and you've tried it out on something a little more meaty than like this kind of example, you realize that it, it can be hard to go back to UIKit after that, uh, to use the table views, collection views, so on, and so on. Um, we've had a great experience with React Native. We were skeptical at first. Um, I think that's only a healthy thing for a developer to be about a technology as um, kind of mind-blowing as React Native when it first came out. Um, but I encourage you to look into it, and I encourage you to dabble and try and just evaluate it yourselves. And I hope you have a good time doing so. Thank you for listening. Cheers.